And today's guest, we are excited to have Jill Miller from Yoga Tune Up. Uh, she's a good friend of ours. We love having talks with her. She's full of great information, great person, great family. Uh, so we will let Jill go ahead. Well, thank you. I'm really excited to talk to you guys. I love you. I love your work. And I love uh, all the things that, that brought us to this moment to talking together. Um, I am the co-founder of a company called Tune Up Fitness Worldwide and the author of a book called The Role Model. I'm also a program creator. So I have a program called The Role Model, which is a self myofascial release program to, to reduce it to something very small. Um, and I also have another program called Yoga Tune Up. And I design programs for you know, global gym chains like Equinox, 24-Hour Fitness, uh, Yoga Works, as well as train educators and clinicians from all corners of the world and all different uh, places within the movement and therapy sphere and athletic sphere. Fantastic. And, and there's a lot of focus in your programming on breath work, correct? For sure. That's definitely where I started um, in my own uh you know, I really, the first workshop I ever taught was called Core Integration, the Total Abdominal Awakening. And the premise of, of it was on, first of all, helping people to map themselves from inside out, but using the breathing muscles as, a, uh, as the anchor, as the, the lining of the birthday suit, so to speak, to help people uh, build core strength, emotional resiliency, uh, familiarity with their viscera. It's just endless when you, uh, when you open up the breath can. It's, it's endless where, where you can lead uh, and find yourself with it. And at this point right now, I'm, I'm deep into the writing of my second book, which is about that breath work. So with the, with the breath work that you do, Jill, is it, is it more to get someone to relax or is it also on the other end of the spectrum to get someone amped up and ready to go perform? Um. I don't think you can do breath work without seeing the just the resiliency spectrum. So obviously there are some, um, I'd say tribes within the, the breath work sphere that focus more on output and athletic performance. And then there are those that focus more on stress reduction, uh, more on relaxation and the recovery end of the spectrum. I would say that I'm more on that recovery end of the spectrum overall. And I leave the, the high level athletic and combat um, for, for some of my other colleagues who like to specialize in that space. But you, you need both for your health and for understanding the way your anatomy works, the way your physiology works together. I find it hard personally to try to convey the importance to a, a new client, especially uh, of the importance of being able to optimize their breathing patterns. Mm. Or, and so mm -hmm. is, and I think a lot of the coaches have that issue. Is, yeah, is there yeah. a way that you deliver that message succinctly to people? Interesting. So, I mean, when most people come into my studio or my classroom or my trainings, there, there's already a significant amount of, of buy-in. They know that they need to reduce their, um, uh, their reactivity or their emotional or psychological stress, or they realize that there is an emotional component to the pain that they've been um, chronically stuck with for a while. For people in the training space, you know, I have lots of gimmicks or ways of, you know, helping entice or convince them that this really is a worthy pursuit. Um, you know, there's some show tricks that I deploy. I, I can do some really startling and stunning things with my guts. Uh, I can do a, a, a thing called Nolly Kriya where I can roll my abdomen uh, like a, a washing machine from side to side. And um, that usually arrests the attention of what I call the bubble muscle people, right? the people who are just interested in their HIIT workouts and adding more muscle mass and, uh, and work from an aesthetic view of fitness rather than an inside out view of fitness, which is what, what I do. I'm very process-based. I'm very um, methodical and very imaginative and very subtle to get to really to get to the same end place, which is, you know, I look good, but that's not, that's not where I start. 
excuse me, I don't usually throw out that vanity thing. <laughs> I'm apologizing to the people who have <laughs> followed me for, for years, but I'm actually really happy with my, I'm really happy with my body and it, it took me decades because of my own mental, my own mental illness or my own mental health challenges that prevented me from seeing who I was or from actually even liking myself. Um, and breath work has been a huge part of, of that body acceptance for me. But I was saying um, to go back to your athletes and compelling them to get interested in a simple muscle like the respiratory diaphragm, which is one of the most interesting muscles in the human body. And if I had to um, pick one muscle of your entire anatomy that is the most important one to train, I would easily say it's your diaphragm. And so... Um, to your clients who aren't convinced that breath work is important, uh, you know, I might be kind of a smart ass and I might say, okay, guess what? Let's just take the diaphragm out of the equation today. Please just don't breathe. Let's proceed with the workout and just see how long they can stomach that. It would be impossible. So uh, right away, they will feel the, the physiological um, burden of trying to remove this innermost core, uh, this innermost champion of your life force away from them. Um, you know, if this is a, a tissue, this is a, a, a myofascial structure, it's a, it's a, it's a somatic muscle. It's, you know, it's a, it's a muscle just like your biceps, except that it's not because of the way it's innervated. It moves automatically. You don't have to do anything and your diaphragm is going to keep contracting. In fact, it, the, um, the, the, the fiber types of the, within the diaphragm, the slow twitch fibers are so specialized that even if you pass out from exhaustion or fatigue or from shock, the one muscle, the one somatic muscle that will keep contracting, excuse me, skeletal muscle, is the diaphragm, right? Your heart's going to keep pumping because it, it, it's a smooth muscle. It, it, you can't control your heart, but your diaphragm, the phrenic nerve will tell it to contract you know, there's a, there's a cascade of chemical reactions that happen to get that nerve to say, okay, your turn to contract. Okay, your turn to contract. Um, but that's the miracle of the diaphragm. You know, breath always wins. And so we must respect the diaphragm. We must bow down to it. And we must learn um, about it. We must learn what it does for us. And from where I'm coming from, I really like to help people trace the myofascial continuities uh, that the diaphragm interfaces with. Because the thing about the diaphragm, do you mind if I just keep ranting about the diaphragm? No, this, keep going. no you could, this is what we want. Okay. The thing about the diaphragm is that it is also mysteriously unpeppered with sensory neurons, um, in, in, in proprioceptive sensory neurons. So we don't feel our diaphragm mm -hmm. the way we feel our biceps or our, our you know, biceps femoris, you know, or even your facial muscles, like you feel those muscles contract. You don't feel the diaphragm's motion. It's haunting. It's weird. It's like this ghoul that's living inside you and it's moving up and down all the time. The only time we typically feel the diaphragm is when it is in spasm. And when it is in spasm, you have the hiccups. But even that is vague for many people. Like, so when it goes into that quick spasm um, in, in the hiccups, that's actually a great mapping time. So in order to really develop the map of the diaphragm, um, you have to really trick yourself into positions of subtlety and positions of grandeur, I suppose, that challenge the diaphragm's ability to descend, to ascend, and to mobilize the ribs. So you really have to address all the places the diaphragm connects both directly and indirectly. And it's indirect connections go all the way up to the trigeminal nerve in your face and all the way down to the pelvic floor. So there's, there's lots to do to um, train your diaphragm. That includes your whole axis. And then there are some people that would argue, well, you know, you can feel breath in your feet and you can feel breath in your hands. You have to get very subtle to perceive that. But I've felt some pretty bizarre things in my body um, and that is, a, that is a skill that I like to teach people to do. And that, that, um, that's probably a, a different topic of conversation, that body sense conversation. So do you have a, um, I guess, like a, a simple way for, for listeners to assess the breathing? Oh, man, I have so many. Um, <laughs> how many do you want? How much time do you have? Um, you know, I, I actually taught, so I have a, a, uh, an ongoing program that I developed during the, the lockdown, uh, a live stream 
three, three classes a week. It's been a, a lot of output uh, over the last three months and change. And last Friday, I actually taught a class called Breath Endurance Strategies to Increase Your Breath Holds. Because I am aware there are a lot of uh, people following me that are really into doing breath holds. Now, if you're not familiar with the term breath holds, um, I think the, uh, the Wim Hof method has really made this extremely popular. Um, also, a friend of mine, Brian McKenzie, who has a, a, a course called Art of Breath. Uh, the breath holding is a, really, it's a, it's a dynamic way of um, checking into your body's ability to process carbon dioxide or to tolerate carbon dioxide. And um, the more you can linger longer without air moving into or away from your body, you, it does start to adjust your nervous system in a way. And in a, in a sense, you can hit some, some almost psychedelic transcendent, transcendent peaks of awareness. Now, the yogis have known this forever. I've been practicing yoga since I was 11 years old. And I used wow. to go into the jungle um, every year with my teacher. We would go to the jungle of Costa Rica and sort of rent this little mountaintop and practice for a month a year. I'd save up all my money for an entire year, uh, waitressing and studying, pay my bills ahead of time. And I'd go down and study with my teacher. And we would do what some people would call cult-like practices and, um, <laughs> and do. <laughs> but he's a very respectable person. There's no cult uh, stuff involved. But um, I think to a non-yoga person, that the thought of going on a, a month-long retreat with your teacher might sound a little bit weird. But in the yoga space, that's like, that's what you do to do deep practice. And so we would do um, a number of different, oh gosh, so many different breath patterns and breath patterning with or without um, novel body positions and challenge our breath threshold, both on our inhale holds and the exhale holds, and also um, doing interesting things during the inhale or during the exhale. Um, jumping way ahead, but there, there are four parts to your breath cycle. There's the inhale, there's the the the, the transition after inhale before exhale begins, there's the exhale, and there's the what I call vacation after exhale ends before in, inhale begins. And so when you manipulate those four different parts of breath, uh, you really are playing the keys of your autonomic nervous system. You're, you will change um, your uh, body's ability to tolerate stress or to you know, recognize how you tolerate stress and the kinds of messages that um, start to speak to you in that context. To go back to your question, there are many different ways to um, build your breath tolerance and your breath holds tolerance. So one of the things that I taught in this class at the very beginning, and I just recently learned this, I never even knew about the um, blood oxygen level test, the BOLT score, until I read um, Patrick McCune's book, The Oxygen Advantage. Mm -hmm. And I was really startled at the simplicity of the test. And so I really think that this is um, kind of an ideal baseline for many people now. It just, it's a great test and they have you know, data around it. So, and that is just to simply let your body be in whatever position you're in. And even prior to that, um, I guess even prior to doing a bolt test, you have to be comfortable being able to watch your breath enter and exit your body. And so there is this very strange um, uh, thing that happens when people start to analyze breathing, which is their breath becomes self-conscious. And often you can get anxious just in the focusing upon the object of your breathing, the internal object of your breathing. Um, it's like, don't think of the white elephant in the room. And all of a sudden, right, it's like, oh my God, the white elephant, it's so big, it's pooping, it's <laughs> making noises. And so that's the same thing. Your breath becomes this really oversized mammal or whatever uh, kind of animal elephant is. I can't remember the technical biological term for elephant. Can you guys remember? Oh, is a mammal. mammal. It's a mammal. Yeah, yeah. Pachyderm? Is it a pachyderm? Oh, I'm not sure. Come uh, on. Oh, like the, like, like, the, like the genus. Of yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> genus, species. Gen anyway. Genus elephantus. <laughs> elephantus. All right. <laughs> no, I so have no idea. I'm so disappointed in my, <laughs> in my, um, my biological um, animal knowledge right now. Okay. So anyway, even before administering a bull test, because when I administer a bull test to somebody or ask them to do a bull test, um, their anxiety level just spike. 
Because just knowing in the bold test, you, um, you need to be without air and you want to develop an ability to intercept, to physiologically listen to the signs of your body that are displaying air hunger. So air hunger shows up as um, tightness in your abdomen, or tightness in your throat, a feeling of, uh, that you're short of breath, you need to take a breath, incessant messages from your mind that say, take a breath, take a breath, um, I can't breathe, things like that. So in administering the bolt test, when you, if you're first learning how to breathe, the bolt test, you're not going to have a good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're not yeah. going to be able to be without because there is already anxiety shows up very quickly for people. And so it's interesting in and of itself as a stress test. So I don't typically do that as a first thing. What I start to do is I start to help people manipulate their autonomic nervous system through pressure. And so we use a, a variety of different balls in the role model method uh, that are spongy, grippy, and pliable that are tissue friendly. And so one of the ones that we use when we're doing uh, respiratory training is something called the cordless ball, which is actually an inflated ball. And what the cordless ball does is whether you're, you can lay on it on your waist, lay it on the side of your ribs, lay it directly on your gut or directly on your sternum or the back of your thorax uh, in the back of your lumbar uh, area in any direction is you can actually start to feel, you get biofeedback from the tool about where your body um, is and isn't mobile in relationship to your, the total uh, respiratory pattern that's possible for your body. You know, I've become well known for abdominal massage, which my dear friend Kelly Starrett years ago nicknamed the gut smash. And so in the training space, people are familiar with gut smash. They may not know that um, like eight years ago on YouTube, I showed, taught Kelly how to do this and it blew his mind. And he called it the gut smash. I, I never call it gut smash. I always call it abdominal massage because I tend to use <laughs> cues that are less combative um, mm -hmm. just because of the population that I work with. And, but, you know, if you look up hashtag gut smash on Instagram, it's, it's on. People are all over it. And I'm, I'm so proud of that moment and that video. And you can find it mm -hmm. <laughs> on YouTube. But that is such a great way for people to start to tease mobility into tissues that have been completely neglected, overtrained, and are really inhibiting their body's ability to deeply relax or to acquire a full breath. So when you find that spot with the mm -hmm. ball, basically you get to a, you get to a point a where it's like, spots. oh, this is really uncomfortable. It's harder to it's harder to breathe. Correct? No. Great question. Okay. So this is where the application comes in. This is where other environmental as well as internal factors need to, um, to come into play so that that person doesn't leave their first encounter with the ball in disgust or in pain. Mm. Because one of the things the ball does is it inhibits your breathing. It smushes your diaphragm. It mm -hmm. smushes your intercostals. It makes it difficult to breathe. And so in the, um, in the clinical space, we call this acclimating a pain pressure threshold. And so that acclimation process, if it's not well hosted, meaning if um, the person doesn't have um, tools to help them deal with the stress of that pressure, they may not like it. They may not find value in it. Um, and this is not about a, you know, a war between a body and a ball. This is a, an attempt to help make peace with soft tissues that surround the trunk, that surround your respiratory system, that are a primal way for your nervous system to update and rearrange itself. So you have the keys to the kingdom right there. But if the key feels like a chainsaw, you are less likely to return and try to and try to, to wiggle around and try to decode that unconscious tension that you've been carrying around for quite a mm -hmm. long time. And that unconscious tension could just be from overtraining. It could be from lack of touch. It could be from scar tissue. The number of people that I work with that come to me who've had um, either um, invasive surgeries or laparoscopic surgeries in their core 
is I, I was probably 30% of people. Like, I mean, I, I see a lot of people who are, um, who have a legacy of scars in their body. I mean, most people have some scars, mm -hmm. but I think because I'm so forward on this um, uh, respiratory reboot health, this respiratory recovery platform that I've been doing for 20 years, people trust and they've, they've seen that it works. They've seen that they can adjust their scar tissue, increase the mobility uh, within the, the fascial layers that have become completely agglomerated and um, change their posture, change their breathing and change their relaxation response. So all this to say, it's very important to help your client or your students um, with some uh, peripheral support so that they can attenuate their body's responses to the invasion of this tool. Um, it's not just throw them down the ball and hope for the best. So, I mean, I have a whole, I have multiple trainings that, that, that mm -hmm. help people to develop this acclima acclimation um, response. But I mean, I'm, I'm very happy for the popularity of doing, you know, gut rolling. And I think people eventually figure out, oh, I have to figure out how to let go. I had no idea how much I was holding on um, because that bracing, that muscle bracing is chronic. Like the ball is just already showing you a lot about your chronic, the, that chronicity of um, unknown bracing that is a, you know, it's like your ghost suit. You don't even know you're wearing it. So have you seen people use a, a ball that's too hard to do this? Because the, your balls, it's soft and, you know, it's flexible. But we have all these different foam rollers, different yeah, soft tissue high things. High density and, ones. And yeah, high density is better. You know? <laughs> you <laughs> guys. All this stuff. Right? Oh, you guys. Did you see my Instagram post yesterday? Yes. So that was a good one. I, that was a very good one. Well, thank you. Uh, I well, the Instagram. That oh, well, that, that might have been the that earlier in the day. So, the, so I did two Instagram posts yesterday. By the way, in case anybody is wondering, today is June twenty. Fifth. Fifth. Okay, yeah. so you would look at June twenty, my Instagram on June twenty fourth. So um, yeah, earlier in the morning, I put up a, a post about about abs, about core. Um, but then later in the afternoon, a book that I contributed a chapter to is finally available for pre sale. And so I will tell you about this book because it addresses exactly what we're talking about here of this density, this density conundrum in the self myofascial tool space. So I wrote a chapter. I have to read you the title because it's so long. The title of the book is Fascia Function and Medical Applications. It's being released in late August and it was edited by uh, David Lazondak who wrote mm -hmm. the book Fascia, What It Is and Why It Matters. And, and Dr. Uh, Angela Aki or Aki, Dr. Angela Aki. And so what this book is, it's a 20 chapter compendium of fascia research and fascial therapies as it relates to the medical and clinical space. And so they approached me to write a chapter on self myofascial release for the book. And so I had to read through uh, all the available research, published research and non-published research on self myofascial release tools. And it took me a, a miserable year in, in between doing all the other projects mm -hmm. I was doing of writing this chapter and I learned a lot about self myofascial release tools um, as it relates to the clinical space or trying to make help it relate to the clinical space for the, the future uh, medical doctors, physical therapists, orthopedists, uh, occupational therapists, osteopaths, chiros who will come across this textbook in their training. So um, my chapter is called Clinical Foundations and Applications for Self Myofascial Release with balls, rollers, and tools. So I didn't cover electronic tech. I'm happy to answer questions about electronic tech, but that was not the scope of the chapter. And so one of the, what I found, one of the most interesting assumptions that researchers are making slash not making is a lot of the research is all over the place. So some research says, oh, it helps with um, range of motion and force production and um, jump height and sprint. And then other research just says the opposite. It's like mm -hmm. the research is kind of all over the place, although there is a trend, a, a sort of a global trend. You can see, yes, it does help with range of motion. Yes, it does help with force production, does help with stress reduction. A few other like, yeah, it's, it, it does all these things. But one of the only 
published paper in 99 papers that were published at the time that I wrote, there's only one paper that disclosed a measure, and perk up your ears, because I'm about to give you what the term is, a measure of durometer. Okay. Durometer, so when we think of ground reaction forces, let's talk about ground reaction forces. When you think about mm -hmm. ground reaction forces, the difference between running on asphalt versus running on pavement is what? Mm -hmm. Well, they're your give into the ground and your pushback. Right. Yeah. So do you have more pushback in asphalt or more pushback in solid concrete? Well, if you go into the asphalt, you're going to get a little bit more play into the ground and then that recoil off. But yeah, you're good. So you're going to get that as opposed to the hard cement. Right. So the, the, the asphalt is more shock absorbing mm -hmm. and it also returns forces back to mm -hmm. you. Whereas the cement, you literally crash into it. And There's no it elasticity up. in the cement. And so it's all up to you to then gather your strength to be able to push off to the next thing. Asphalt is a much more comfortable surface to run upon rather than concrete, right? The, the, the density is very different. And there is the tar in the asphalt has some kind of rubber elements. Now, I'm not a I'm not a, 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 a substance geophysicist. Like, I don't know all the stuff about that, but you can tell in your body the difference between jumping on asphalt versus jumping on concrete. Uh, yeah, right? the impact is big, yeah. Right, the impact is different. And so tools are the same kind of thing. When we use a tool that has no give, it crushes your body's tissues. Your body's natural defense system is the muscle bracing response that is governed via the muscle spindle. So when your body senses that it is being pushed into, has no, it has no ability to absorb that um, tool, it braces to prevent harm from happening to it. And that's mediated by your central nervous system. So it ticks up your sympathetic outflow, which is counter to the idea of rel a relaxing massage. Mm -hmm. You really have to work hard when you're working with a hard tool to overcome that muscle bracing response. But a Korean team, there's one, this one team, I mean, literally out of 99 papers, there's one paper that decided to disclose the tension within the stress transfer medium. Stress transfer medium is another word for massage tool. So they used a lacrosse ball and then they used a, a gushy ball, which happens to have the same durometer as uh, just a little bit harder than our gorgeous ball. So something in between our yoga tuna ball and our gorgeous ball. And they, they put the balls on 65 and older people with chronic neck pains, necks. Are now, we talking all, at the base of the skull? At the base of the skull. Okay. Yeah, sub okay. sub okay. sub okay. Now, first of all, to find a study that's actually looking at chronic pain, and with people over the age of 21, <laughs> because all these studies are done on college age students. There are so few that are indexing people with actual conditions and people who are over the age of 23 years old. I'm telling you, it was like impossible. But this one study was so amazing um, that, that it featured this uh, cohort of elderly people in chronic neck pain. They put the lacrosse ball on half and they put the softer ball on the other half. And guess what they found? The yeah. softer ball. Yeah. Because they, they couldn't even get to the muscle target with the hard ball because they're to the suboccipital muscles because the upper traps went crazy. The MG went crazy because when that ball went onto that person's skull, they braced yeah. and they couldn't let go. The softer ball was somehow able to disarm that muscle bracing response and so the tissue target was reached those those patients were able to improve their range of motion um, due to that fact due to the the touch being distributed where they wanted it to go so what we need to do is to sort of take a step back and take a look at this fundamental i think misconception in, in the training space that harder is better. In the case of myofascial release tools, softer tools are superior because they respect the, the nervous system as mm. well as the actual tissues and fluids of the body. Now, I have a bias, obviously, because my whole life I've been using soft tools. I have hard tools too. You know, I started with a ma roller, that little wooden roller that I got 
when I was 14 years old. I used to roll it up and down my spine. Good thing I was 14 when I was doing that and not like 72 and using a wooden roller, right? So there might be a time and there is a time and a place for harder tools, um, but you must be able to attenuate your own stress response to them. So I'm not anti-hard tools, but I just, for a general population and also for, um, for people who are dealing with chronic pain and chronic conditions um, or potentially um, autoimmune issues, um, things that could be spiked by their body going into a defensive response, we may want to take a look at tools that um, have a, a, a lower durometer than mm. these PVC pipe tools, which are so popular. And it's like, you can, t you can just tell me all day, Dennis, this is a lower density or higher density. When you crack open the density, it's still surrounding a hard Hardcore. foam yeah. or a hard PVC. And mm. so this is my, you know, this is just kind of my fundamental, um, my challenge with all the research, except for just a very small handful of papers. And I had to reach, I reached out to researchers because there was also this other one in um, Spain and she, oh God, I got to look at my paper. I can't remember the name of the ball, but it was a ball that I had never even heard of, a sport I had never even heard of um, that's similar to racquetball. They played in Mexico and they played in Spain. I can't remember. It's like a racquetball. Um, but it's a Is it a high lie? Maybe. Is they got a scoop at the end of their hand? I don't know. No? Is that like a racquetball? Okay. Yeah, but it's a scoop. I'm going to have to look it's this up actual, it's, it's actually, it's very popular in Florida. It used to be. Uh, I have to, I mean, honestly, um, it's in my paper and I haven't reread it in a few months. So in the known is it called world. Basque? Basque Peloto? I can't remember. Okay. The best comparison is to a racquetball. So yeah, so that's a, that ball has yield. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah. it's a firm rubber, but it's compressible, right? Um, and then it's hollow on the inside. So these are, these are just things to, to uh, consider in um, applying self-myofascial release tools to your body. Um, foam rollers, you know, people think, oh, well, foam roller, that's, that's foam. You can stand on a black foam roller and not destroy it. It won't yeah. even change its shape. Yeah. So the old foam rollers that I grew up with, those white ones that they just, they, they just like, it was basically a sponge. It just collapsed. <laughs> um, and then it was like really kind of smudgy and gushy. The black foam rollers are very, very hard foam. Even though if you, if you find each, you, know, you can pick off the foam and, and squish it. But when that foam uh, meets other foam, it's a very hard object. So its durometer is very high. Um, my friend Sue Hitzman, who created the melt method, she has these amazing foam rollers that are like, they've got a lot of uh, rubber in them and they're, they're, they're gushy and um, they're incredible for the body. You can use a hard tool also to create shear. Um, and so there are also applications with a hard tool or with a soft tool that can do things that can disarm the muscle bracing response. And so that, that just needs education. So, I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not anti hard tools. I think you can use them intelligently, but I think there are certain processes that you want to sort of induce your body into in order to be able to, to be able to acclimate better to the pressure so that you're not just, you know, rolling yourself into a stress ball while you're trying to relieve your stress. How much does mindset play into this also? And what I mean by that is mm -hmm. I love all sorts of myofascial release work, whether it's yes. your traditional, what most people love, oh, you got that massage therapist getting in there. I mean, they're really getting in there all the way to Reiki healing where mm -hmm. you're barely being touched. I love all of them, right? But I've told clients, especially ones that are like, I need that just uh, that aggressive yes. stuff. And I'm like, eh, let's try something different. So I'll, I'll source them out. I'll say, hey, why don't you go visit so-and-so? They do this type of, but I will tell them, I'll say, you must be receptive to what you're about to receive. I said, because if you go in there with a closed mind, you're going to come out going, what the hell did I just waste my time with? And, yeah. and I have had a couple of clients that have had that experience. And I'm like, you got to go in and just let go. You can't hold on to stuff, which is easier said than done, of course. So it's interesting. You know, uh, there, was a, there was a great seminar I watched a few weeks ago 
um, on the, I'm a member of the Fashion Research Society, and I'm a real fashion nerd, in case you guys, if I, I haven't started really talking about fashion yet, but <laughs> don't get me started. Um, that would be nice. <laughs> well, I sort of did just now, um, but I was talking more nervous system stuff. And I think her name is uh, Fabiana Silva, and she's a Brazilian uh, researcher and massage therapist. And she presented a, a lecture about touch and how touch travels through different pathways in your body and what it does to your emotional system and to your sensory motor system. And so she was trying to distinguish between different times, different types of, of touch um, and the intentionality of the touch to affect these different pathways. And so, for example, um, a, you know, a Reiki or a, does, in Reiki, do they, do they touch the skin? Do they do? Very um, lightly. Yeah. Touch? Very, very lightly. light. Very light. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm, I've also had massage massage where they're just working on your fields, right? Mm-hmm. They're not even mm-hmm. touching you, but they're, they're touching, um, they're, they are touching you because they're touching your energy. Your, so yeah. the electromagnetic waves around you. And that does go into the skin, the Merkel cells in some, in some manner, there is um, a receptivity in the sensory field there just through that sort of hover, that hover touch. But she was distinguishing between affective touch, which would be the kind of touch that you would do to a baby. And Neil knows that about all about this because he's a beautiful two year old daughter and you're about to meet your son. The type of touch that we give to infants or the type of caress that we give to somebody in pain or to somebody that we love, something that we want to make feel better, literally the touch is felt in our emotional centers. It goes, it is, and she calls this affective touch. Um, And it works with the tactile C fibers that are embedded in your skin. And and there's evidence also that stimulating these tactile C fibers um, boosts your immune system. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, just think about like when your baby is not feeling well or not breathing well, when you do these, these very slow motion strokes, you know, how their whole mood changes, how their breathing changes. And then there's the motor type of touch where you're trying to like, I want to touch muscle. I want to touch myofascia. And so you have to go to a certain depth to try to affect the, the, the neurons that are embedded within the fascial tissues that surround or interpenetrate a, a, a known muscle structure. And so that's going to um, sensory motor aspect of your brain. So we have some touch that's going to the, I think the thalamus is where the, the affective touch is going. And the other stuff is going to the sensory motor components. But ultimately, we need all of these types of touches. Now, the affective touch for some people may lead them to performance gains. That's the touch they need to reset. Whereas other people may need that like all the way to the bone type of thing that resets them. And so I I don't know where this gets sort of set in your biology or your developmental history or um, your body's experience of trauma or not trauma. Um, But, you know, everybody could benefit from both, but some people need more of one and some people need more of other to feel balanced and to feel um, you know, their own homeostatic foundation. Oh, that's great to know. Wow. Yeah, it's but almost like... I do think, I do think you want to train both. So those people that have an aversion to that neuroaffective touch, um, you know, that's where like, that's kind of like where I come in with the gorgeous ball and the mm-hmm. breath work. Um, but I like going deep. I like going what we call balls deep. I like going <laughs> really deep, clear the bone. I like, I like it all. And, um, and so I, I'd want to encourage um, people to, um, yeah, to be open and, and maybe use a little bit of that science like I just dropped on you to, to get curious about that and um, to see that that is also training a muscle also. It's training your tolerance for light touch. It's also training your, t- your tolerance for compassion and empathy. You know, there are other, you know, subtle aspects of our nature that we can, you know, be more well-rounded about right now. Can't we? Don't you think? Yeah, no, very true. Very true. Go back to breathing a little bit. Um, sure. You know, everyone's wearing, or not everyone, but when you go to these stores, now you're kind of mandated to wear masks. Yes. And everything. So are we doing more harm being in a mask all day? Or, are we tra- uh. or can we actually use it as a training tool? I, I mean, I think, I, think, I think all the things. I think about masks all the time now. Um, 
I'm sure anybody who teaches breathing is thinking about masks all the time. I also teach um, facial massage. I teach something I call fascia facial. I just taught that the other day on my on my my course. I'm also extremely steeped and read in something called polyvagal theory um, that really relies on cues of the face to um, for uh, interrelating. So the masks have so many layers for me to unpack and and share potentially you know some of that with you. The first thing I'll say regarding breathing, and this was on Instagram, this was learning on Instagram the other day, I came across a feed, and I'm not going to remember her name, I'm really mad at myself, she's a pulmonary physical therapist, she's based in Canada, she's based in Canada, I think in Toronto, and she was um, using some tech, she hooked herself up to tech, and it's a nine minute IGTV video, I reposted it on my story, but I didn't post it on my regular feed. I'm following her now, but I just can't remember her name. So um, first she just did, um, she was checking CO2 levels uh, during just quiet breathing. And so she quieted down after she started her lecture and then went for about 45 seconds and, you know, showed the waves of her CO2 saturation. Um, And then she put the mask on and then showed 45 seconds of quiet breathing, the CO2 saturation. There's no change between her breathing with the mask or breathing without the mask. Her point with this was to show that the mask really isn't changing your oxygen and CO2 levels. But what does change the CO2 levels is how you feel about the mask. So the mask in and of itself isn't the barrier. It's your um, discomfort or displeasure or the anxiety it creates for you to have that covering, that's what starts to alter the um, mm. CO2 ratio. And this brings us all the way back to the beginning of our conversation, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, about, about the Bolt test and about just um, having something, the perception of something inhibiting you changes that. So that the mask in itself isn't um, making uh, changes. Now, obviously, when you put on your mask, you, know, you don't want to over tight. If you have a metal thing, you don't over tighten it and, and um, block your nose and things like that. You know, but one thing I have found with a mask personally when I wear it is I I find myself more mouth breathing more frequently than not. And I'm always surprised at at that because I'm a I nose breathe all the time. I'm I mean I've been trained in it since I was eleven years old. I got a big nose. <laughs> lots of you know, no deviated septum. <laughs> Certain angles, it looks smaller. Uh, no. Another <laughs> angle, like, it um, you know. But <laughs> I'm totally off track now. Um, yeah, so I have found that that, that just feel, the fabric somehow stimulates me to have my mouth more open than closed. So that's something that I'm trying to repattern, and it's annoying. Um, but I'm also thinking, you know, my kids now especially my, my six-year-old, like the preschoolers, they're not forcing them to keep their masks on all the time, but the um, elementary school age, they're going to be forced to keep the masks on all the time unless really? they have. I just can't see yeah, that so, happening. I can't see kids wearing masks and, and well, keeping them on, you know? Yes. And it, so I know if I'm defaulting to mask breathing, to, excuse me, to mouth breathing, well, yeah. that I would suspect that a lot of children who are typically nose breathers are just here behind the mask and we can't see that yeah. and that this could become a new uh, breath pattern. I mean, there's so many things that are going to happen to our kids <laughs> <laughs> in this generation. I'm like pulling my hair out like, Oh my God, they can't see mouths. They can't see noses. They're only interpreting, you know, obicularis oculi and frontalis here. They can't see what I'm really feeling down here. That's just stresses me out. But um, so we try to, you know, Obviously, at home, nobody's wearing masks. Anyway, there's my thoughts. Happy. But right. you're Thank right you. about that reaction to the mouth breathing. I find the same exact thing. When you put that on, yeah, with it just switches. You go from nose to mouth. It's, it is. I found that the same exact thing. I was like, I have to stop doing that. Isn't it weird? Is that happening to you too, Neil? No, you know what? When I put it on, I consciously make myself breathe through my nose. So, I don't know. It's... I guess I think about it more. Yeah. Well, you have to make maybe, yourself think about yeah, it. Maybe for I, sure. think, I think about it more. Yeah. yeah. I mean, today was the longest I've ever worn a mask. I got my hair did. 
There you go. Looks very nice. Looks very nice. Oh my god. So that was amazing. on a poll for people. Like, what's the first thing you're gonna do hair. when you get out of lockdown? And I think haircut was number one. Yeah, it feels really good to have a haircut. <laughs> um, but yeah, so at the salon, I had two two hours of mask wearing. And that was the first time I've had to wear my mask probably for more than 30 minutes because the only other time I'm wearing it is marketing, um, which usually takes about a half an hour. And there's no other public engagement that I'm doing where I need, you know, need to wear a mask. So I learned a lot today, but I didn't feel like I was out of breath. Um, I was also sitting, getting my hair cut. I wasn't exercising. And I know that with gyms reopening, and you and I are, we're both in the state of California, um, they have to wear masks in the gyms. So I'm, yeah, I'm definitely wondering how that's all going to go, especially because as the mask gets moister with your exhale, mm -hmm. yeah. um, it, that in and of itself becomes a barrier for, for airflow. Although air is flowing uh, peripherally, right. In all mm -hmm. the pockets where the mask isn't fully in contact. So, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to the gym, but a lot of people, you know, they should, and they are, and you're going to just have to retrain yourself. I think it yeah. is an opportunity, Neil. I mean, like, it is an opportunity. And I think that's but, one of the reasons why at-home workouts are still going to be, have gained popularity and are still going to stay pretty popular for, oh, sure. for quite yeah, a while. I mean, there's there's a lot a of while. fear, I think. I think just talking to my clients, um, mm -hmm. I would say 60 to 70% of them are more comfortable working out at home, at, at least right now, you know, whether through virtual types of training. And you know, they're like, nah, I don't want to go back to the gym. Even if it opened tomorrow, I wouldn't go back. Yeah, that, that choir in Washington, like where everybody got sick after choir practice. I mean, that's what the gym's like. You're just breathing and rebreathing. And there, so it does, it definitely gives me pause. Um, I, I, you know, I think everybody has to evaluate, obviously, everybody has to evaluate their risk. Everybody is evaluating um, their risk, I hope, you know, recognizing that the other uh, homesteaders in their home or neighbors or, there's just a lot to think about here. Well, because you guys down in LA are open, but here in this Bay Santa Area, we're, we're still yeah. just shut down. Oh, you're still closed. Oh yeah. yeah. There's no there. There isn't even a date of reopening yet. It's just yeah. They haven't even looked at filing the paperwork to start the process of opening up gyms. So I think mm -hmm. the the earliest we're going to really see it is is August. Yeah. So it's going to be quite interesting to see how that f plays out. It's like you said with the school thing with kids, it's, that's going to be such a massive uh, experience, so to speak, uh, just to see how that goes. Yeah. yeah because you have playgrounds. Like, what are, you, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to keep kids apart on the playground? You can't do that. They're going to touch each other. Well, They're going to. I think, I mean, I can describe the model of the, you know, my, my son's preschool. Uh, has a model. He's back at camp. We were able to get both of our kids into camp this week. Lila is at a kind of a nature camp about a half an hour outside of the city where they're outside all day. So she's like setting traps for Bigfoot. There we go. <laughs> ah, <that's awesome. laughs> building, you know, building forts and swinging on, you know, big tree swings. And it's kind of like idyllic and, you know, everything you would ever want to do as a you know, nature camp. And then Asher is in a city, you know, little preschool with a tiny sweet playground. It's on the campus of a religious school. And there's, you know, like six to seven kids in his class and the teachers are wearing masks and that it's really a control group. You know, we are not allowed to go in the building. We drop him off uh, in the morning and we have to use our own pen to sign him out Oh. And they take his temperature before he's allowed on campus. And there's lots of precautions being taken, but this is a private, you know, it's a private preschool. Preschools are under different um, type of parameters than elementary age. Uh, and I mean, we just keep watching everything fluctuate. My, my father is an infectious disease doctor. He's actually on the front lines of COVID. Um, he works down at Scripps um, down in La Jolla. And so I've been getting information from him god since january i mean in january i was set to go travel to washington state to teach at a yoga conference up there and four days before the conference the first person you know because it, it, you heard there was news mm, happening in yeah. china and then all of a sudden somebody died um, in washington state of covid and i called my dad because he didn't you know he didn't know that i was going to washington i said dad i'm gonna i'm gonna go teach at a conference in in seattle 
um, and this, you know, this COVID thing just happened. What do you think I should do? Or what are your thoughts? Not what do you think I should yeah. do? And he said, don't get on the plane. Don't leave your house. <laughs> In January, yeah. he said, don't uh, get on the plane. Don't leave your house. Because I think he knew what was coming, but I didn't listen to him. I got on the plane. I went and I taught hundreds of people in a conference center in Seattle. Um, came home uh, the night that Kobe passed away, right? The, the helicopter oh, crash. Wow. And so I was more worried about my plane crashing than getting COVID at that point because of all the, the images on the news were all Kobe, Kobe and, and his family. Um, but I got back home. I didn't get sick. I thank God. But then, you know, then February started to, to march on. And then here we are. But, um, you know, I've been conferring with my dad as much as he'll talk to me about this stuff because he's so sick of talking about COVID. Um, but he sends me, he sends me really cool research. Like, like I'm doing this, in this uh, <laughs> passing along a file. Yeah. <laughs> like as if we were spies. So, Putting it right under the door. Right, don't, let, I, don't let anyone see this. <laughs> um, so I really like reading a lot of the pre, um, pre-published research. And, um, and I, I definitely draw confidence um, in my discussions with him about um, treatment and about the progress of, of, you know, vaccine creation. And, you know, I kind of have the sources that I go to. I, I don't listen to the media. Um, I try to just look at the science and the research to draw my conclusions. And, um, and I think I'm a little annoying that way, but I feel, I feel, um, feel very safe sending my kids to back to school. Yeah. I think when you have good resources around you, uh, I think that's really where you want to start. So if you if you have relationships, especially family relationships with medical practitioners, uh, I think that's really where you want to get your information from, uh, because yeah. they have you know they have your best interest at heart. Right. I mean, really, that's really what it comes down to. There's no political motivation behind it or anything else. They're just you're asking as a friend, as a family member, and they're just trying to give you their best input. Because they don't want to see you get sick, so they're right. going to give you. Know. These are his grandchildren, and if he were worried about them, yes. he would tell me. I mean, yeah. back in January, he told me don't get on the plane because there were yeah. so many unknowns. But at this point, I think he's got a, a you know different perspective, having been in the field, having treated a lot of COVID patients mm-hmm. and discharged many, which is like mm-hmm. yay. You know, people mm-hmm. are uh, there are people not dying that get COVID. I mean, yeah. we, we hear about the numbers, and the numbers are. Are crazy, but I'm not a data a data analyst. But I, of course, I'm thinking about it all the time, just like you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I mean, to see the impact that it's had on people's businesses, and it, and it's hard. It yeah. it's really it's it's finding that balance between saving lives and preventing illness and day to day living, putting food on the table, and and it's to see the. The reactions uh, between those two things has been quite interesting, to say the least. Um, but one of the things that's saving my life is your stick mobility sticks. Well, We're thank you. Talking about you guys. Thank you. Talking about you. <laughs> love those sticks. Show them uh, to everybody. Thank you for your support. We love what you teach. And for people that are listening, uh, we will. I mean, it's it's it takes some time, folks. But we are planning on getting something together with Jill, a collaboration. We so, have a great collaboration. It's all. I mean, it's all planned out. It's just matter, <laughs> can we get in the same space at the same time so we can put it on tape? Tape, right? Especially what it comes down to. Yeah. No, it's going to happen. It, it'll happen. Yeah. It's just, uh, and it's funny because you're like, you, you want it to happen now, but, it, you know, things happen. It, I freaking you know, want it to. I mean, there's so much I wanted to ha- takes, want to happen right now. Right? My God. Yeah. Oh, my God. So you uh, collaborated with the Move You official guys. That mm-hmm. was nicely done. Mm-hmm. And what was funny is, Dr. Mike is a free diver and, and I find ever since I was a kid, I like, I've always been fascinated with that. Mm-hmm. And cause I used to practice trying to hold my breath in my pool. Mm-hmm. How long can I hold my breath? Mm-hmm. But when I see how long free divers can hold their breath, that is just mind blowing. It to is mind blowing. Well, what's the world record on that? Oh, it, I don't even, I can't, I'd have to but look. They're going up. upwards of 10 15 minutes, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, on um, Oprah, the Oprah Winfrey show, I think like in 1995 or six or seven or eight or nine or I don't know, one of those. But if you look up David Blaine, Oprah Mm -hmm. Winfrey, he submerged himself into a tank 
he did, um, I don't know how, I mean, maybe 18 months or 15 months of preparation of his body and his mind um, to break a world record. And he submerged himself in a tank. And it was, I think, eight, it was just over 18 minutes that he was on live TV. Crazy. Crazy. He's an alien. Tank. And it just shows you if you, you can deploy the pharmacy of your parasympathetic nervous system and go into essentially hibernation, this is something that is within our biology to do, but it is really the extreme of our biology. I have no desire to be without breath for that long. Um, but there are some individuals that, you know, it, hats off that's crazy you know? 18 yeah. minutes well there are still french uh in the french polynesian islands there are still tribes mm. that still hunt fish like their ancestors and they dive and they're walking on the bottom with spears yes. and, and they're down there for 10 minutes like it's not a big deal for them and they still hunt that way that's still how they bring home food uh, for, for the table, it's it's crazy. It's crazy that. too because they have to be explosive underwater. Yeah, you know, right when they see it, see it, boom! You got to be like, able to boom. They're on minute nine and then they have to explode. Yeah, and then and the yeah. thing with the free diving is not just holding the breath, but the depth and the thinking depth. about the pressure, yeah, the pressure on the human on body, your, on your ears, right, on your chest. Yes, I j because even sitting, I mean, we you get in a pool and you go from the surface to ten feet down, you're like. I feel that. Yeah. And that's only 10 feet. And it's yeah. just like, but I again, it's an acc it's an acclimation process. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and having that kind of pressure on your body in and of itself is sedating. So, you know, picture yourself. Um, I mean, this is actually a tool for autistic kids is they have these tubes that they, um, they go into that uh, makes them feel oh, like they're in the womb, like that compression okay, yes. in all directions. And so this is a native, this is a, you know, an implicit reflex that we have in our body. Um, but just acclimating to underwater with no air. It's like, okay, then you're going to add that to it. And you're going to add that to it. And what about the temperature? How hot is it? How cold is it? Yeah. You know, there's so much like I am not, I like, I like meditating, but not that much. <laughs> <laughs> Can you uh, talk a little bit more about the, um, I forget the terminology, the, the stomach rolling. Your oh, Nali Kriya. Nali Kriya. Yes. The, to see it is just incredible to see. Yeah. It really you is. See it? Do you guys want to see it? Yeah. yeah, go, yeah. I think I'm, I'm past my yeah. lunch uh, okay. enough. All I right. Okay. okay. And then Dennis so. will go and then I'll go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So just got to expose the abdomen. You exhale all your air. Yeah. That's, that's so crazy. The, <laughs> That's cool. That's awesome. So can you go both directions? Yeah, you do. Yeah, you oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you answered my question. <laughs> like, what shit? Can you draw my name? <laughs> so what you couldn't see is that I had to put the this in my mouth so that it wasn't dangling in front. But that was all. That was all on that vacation after exhale before inhale. Um, Nali Kriya has to happen in a vacuum. So the, the first thing that, that one needs to do is to void your body of air and then stretch the respiratory diaphragm. And so there's a, a practice I teach called the diaphragm vacuum that is really step one of this, of this process. And I actually did, I actually did a 30 minute breakdown of Nali Kriya on, it's in the replay library of, of, uh, of my classes because people are, are so curious about it. And I just break it down anatomically. When I first started to learn this, it was all mystics. It was all mystical. It was just total woo-woo baloney. And it frustrated me that like, when you would read about it in the, in the yogic textbooks, it just would say, oh, let the yellow bird fly free. It will turn an old man's hair black again. I mean, it's all this sort of mystical uh, 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 phrasing around what Nali Kriya does. Oh, and there's certainly no information on, on how to do it. I actually took my body to anatomists and said, what is happening here? <laughs> oh. um, and had some people explain or had a, a couple of different anatomists try to explain what, uh, what nerves were firing and 
and things like that. But what I've basically figured out is that this is the obliques activating on within a uh, stretched diaphragm with no air. And so when the obliques activate, you know the actions of the obliques primarily are rotation, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and la- lateral movements. And we usually have this rotation happening in a, you know, when we think of rotation, it's this open chain thing, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But what's happening is the bones in Nali Kriya, the bones are fixed in place, but the muscles contract in a, uh, in a constant circle. Well. Yeah. Yeah, because the so hips are cool. staying still, yeah. and yeah. Yeah, wow. so the hips are staying still, and I did that. I did that squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Mm-hmm. You can see that I'm not, I'm not activating. So right now, right, I'm, yeah, not, I'm bracing yeah. and I'm tensing, yeah, right? yeah. but I'm actually totally passive. Totally yeah. passive wow. in the diaphragm vacuum. But then once you do nollie, you have to be able to have a motor map. This is why we roll. Have a yeah. motor map of how to connect to the obliques exclusively and activate them without letting your bones move um, while still remaining without air in this deep parasympathetic undersea exploration. Um, so we use the gorgeous ball to stimulate and all the yoga tuna, the roll mo- the yoga tuna balls, the plus mm-hmm. balls, the alpha ball, we stimulate the sensory system. And when the, stimu- the sensory system is stimulated, it improves your accuracy of motor firing. It improves your force production and improves your force steadiness. And um, that's some research from uh, my friend, Dr. Robin Capobianco, who uh, is a neurophysiologist and, and did a study on the yoga tuna balls that was published in the European Journal of Sports Sciences and the Journal of Sports Sciences. And so we can just extrapolate from her study that this is probably happening all over the body to whatever tissue that we target, um, that we get this improvement of our, our sensory map, but then we get an improvement of the, the motor production into that uh, area. So... You know, something like this, Nali Kriya, which seems so mystical and yogic and ancient, um, this, is, this is within, you know, each human's, it's in the hardware. It's yeah. just you got to get the software for it. It's interesting to see, you know, how people, through what we do just through everyday life, we just tend to do things. We want to look a certain way, so we just pack everything in, brace everything, and and so it's, it's one of those gotta things. Let that to, stuff go. You gotta, you gotta let it go, get, right? You gotta get fluffy. Yeah, that's one of our playful words. Is you know you know fluff that shit up because um, <laughs> you know <laughs> fluffy fluffy bodies honor the the foundational architectural shape of, of fascia, which is the polytetrahedron. Yeah. You know you are multidimensional, and so you want to be more of a fluffy version of yourself rather than a, a shellacked, agglomerated version of yourself. As my friend Kelly Starrett says, you don't want to be a grilled cheese sandwich that's been in the panini press. Yeah, you, <laughs> that's a great correlation. Those are really good. Do you have anything uh, coming out in that uh, the listeners might be interested in or anything that's... Uh, oh, yeah, I do. You know, guys, I finally, we're still, we don't have the link up yet, but I finally am about to launch for the first time ever, ever, ever one of my trainings online, the demand has always been there, but I have always been a anti-online training advocate. I I really think that long-form trainings need to happen in the presence of others, especially in the presence of the teacher-student relationship. Um, And so we ran this experiment for the last three months of, of having my classes go online. And the response has been incredible. This is this, there is no other way to get educated right now. And I'm supposed to be in London in a few weeks, but you know they're not letting yeah, people from California no. into England yeah, no. or Germany. I'm supposed no. to go to England and Germany. So I can't quarantine there in order yeah. to go and teach. So we're transferring that breath and bliss into an online training. And then shortly thereafter, we will do the role model training online. And so I'm really excited to be able to you know, I've reworked the syllabus. I mean, it's the same syllabus, but I've worked it out so that it can um, uh, work online. And then we can have interactive and practicum elements, which are which is what we have in the course. So I'm really 
uh, excited about being able to be with a, a cohort of people that are dedicated to, you know, this one slice of the learning pie and, you know, be with them, if not in the room, but, you know, virtually. So that's coming up July 20th through 22nd. Um, I don't know when this is going to air live, but I also have a uh, self I have a role model sampler class um, that's scheduled also for that same institute in London on July 19th. It's a two and a half hour workshop. If somebody just wanted to have the experience of, of two and a half hours of rolling out their whole body and a, a um, an easy access model of that. And so that's just a, that's just a workshop, but then the training is something different and that's um, July 20th through 22nd. So you can still register for the role model workshop with Tri-Yoga for July 19th, but the training will be, we'll be processing those registrations because we have to handle all the tech and the filming and the zooming and things like that. So, but yeah. And, and then um, this fascia book for those of you who wow. are clinicians and you're interested when we was talking about the fascia function and medical applications um, that is, it's, it's not my book. It's just, I have a chapter in it. There's lots of other amazing fascia researchers, names that you would recognize, Robert Schleip, Tom Myers, mm -hmm. Peter Levin, um, and then uh, David Lazondak. So that's coming out in August. I have a, a walking project that I'm releasing with my dear friend, Katie Bowman. Oh, uh, it's oh, called, nice. walking, it's cool. called Walking nice. Well, the Stepwise Approach to an Everyday Movement. And we'll be, that's a, a whole breakdown of the human walk and rollouts to help you be able to do the movements. And we're going to be releasing that um, in the fall. Let's see. Oh, Tom Myers and I are teaching together on July 11th. We're teaching a... a a day long workshop on the deep front line called press pause, a deep breath with Jill Miller and Tom Myers. Um, and that you can find that through his website and through my website. We're supposed to be teaching together this summer, uh, yeah, but I yeah. couldn't get to Maine cause I'd yeah, have to yeah. quarantine. There's <laughs> quarantine. Well, we'll make sure we get this out before that then. So that way people are listening, they can jump on that for sure. That'd be great. Um, and definitely, we want to definitely get Katie on here. We love Katie's writing. Oh my God. She's fantastic. She, she just has a really great way of just being an easy communicator. Yes. And oh my just, God, was I a hard communicator? No, no, okay. no. What we talk about sometimes is we're like, that's really the art of coaching, right? Just getting people to be able to relate. And I love her evolution from her first book to what she's currently been writing. And she, and she says it, she goes, yeah, if you would have t asked me 10 years ago, how should my foot strike be? I would have given you my school educated biomechanical answer. This is the way. And then she goes, but through my life experience and through everything I've evolved, I've changed my opinion about how certain things work. And, and that's really as, as educators and coaches, we're, we still all do that. So for the trainers out there, coaches out there, that are just getting into this industry or, or trying to find a way. I mean, we're all learning all the time. There's always new information. Yes. So we're always students. Uh, and so the people that you see on stage or, or you're paying to go listen to talk, they're still constantly trying to learn new things because every three to five years, your, your teaching should be at least subtly different because oh, you, you know you found some new information. It doesn't have to be drastically different, but it should at least subtly be different. Yeah, hopefully you were onto something in the beginning. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 So, because what's kind of interesting is I think what's, uh, we, a lot of our trainers in this industry don't, continue to take continuing education yeah well you and i i mean the three of us and you know katie and like tom tom myers i mean mm -hmm. these are we're we're lifers the commitment is is to always be learning so that you can stay inspired by what you're teaching mm -hmm. um you know it's really not fun if you're if what your your pedagogy and um your output isn't you know challenged and in the, you know, in the challenge either gets stronger or it adapts and grows in a different direction. Um, you know, I've learned, oh my gosh, I just, I've learned so much just even in the last two years. And then my, you know, perspective on life being a parent, it changes the lens that you have on things. I love this industry and I love, um, I'm a part of a few different industries, but I love like, I love what I get to do and I get to help so many different types of people. Um, of all walks of life, I, we are, I feel like we are really um, helping the general population to live better in their body, to 
prevent pain, to improve their their life, their lifespan. Um, and we get to just keep learning, you know, like mm-hmm. how cool is that? It's not a stagnant thing. No, very true. Any last uh, final thoughts or? No, like I have thousands on? of thoughts. We've been talking <laughs> for a really long time. If anybody is still listening, you can find more of my thoughts at my Instagram at yoga tune up or on the brand page at tune up fitness. <laughs> Thank you very much for everybody listening out there. If you're not following Jill, make sure you get on to her accounts. She's full of great information. Uh, be sure to check her out. And if she's in your town in the future or oh, online, yeah. make sure you jump in and, and get some education in person because the online stuff is great. But just like she said, when we get to finally be face to face, there's just it's that so much different. There's so much different. The dynamics are just different. And the, and the learning is much, much more um, permanent, so to speak, in my For opinion, sure. when, sure. when, when you're face to face versus just watching a video. So agreed. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jill. We appreciate you. We love you. And, uh, we look forward to having you on again. In the oh, not too distant I'm happy, future. happily. We'll pick so, a narrow topic and go deep. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, until next time, thank you for everybody for listening and thank we you will guys. see you guys later. Peace. Peace.